Hey, Daddy, this is Bill Alfonso, the manager of champions, Daddy. I call it right down the middle, and I got a winner for you. You're watching the Wrestling Paradox Podcast, Daddy. Check it out. They're badass, just like me. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome back inside the Paradox. This is a very, very, very special episode we are bringing to you, uh, and we'll call it incredible, possibly. Uh, this is going to be an amazing night. Uh, first of all, you know who I am, Joseph Anthony, my boy Thrasher sitting on the other side of the camera. Say what's up, Thrasher. You know who I am. Ah, you know who that is. The place. Yes, sir. Uh, so, uh, first things first, M&J Ecological, always keeping your South Florida streets clean. Uh, 305-697-2258. Make sure you guys give them a shout out if you have any pests, iguanas, raccoons, whatever you want to get rid of that's in your yard. Kids, I don't care what it is. Call Marcus, 305-697-2258, and M&J Ecological will take care of all of your needs. Uh, uh, shout out to CCW on Twitter, CCWFL, one of the longest-running schools in South Florida. We just hit their 17th anniversary show, and between the top rope Spanish fly and the elbow drop by James Creed, that show was absolutely amazing. So make sure you guys get on CCW Alive on YouTube. Check them out. Follow him on you, uh, Twitter at CCWFL. Um, Chris, this is a landmark night for the Paradox. Do you know why? Uh, I, I mean, it's going to make I mean, my dreams come true. I mean, if you had asked me, tw- if you'd asked me 20, 20 years ago, I'd be sitting here talking to this man. I would have called you a liar. Stone-faced liar. I reached out to this man we're about to talk to on Twitter. Took a little bit. I got a response finally. And I said, oh, awesome. So we worked out some details. And ladies and gentlemen, we finally have him inside the paradox. The man that anytime I saw a kendo stick, or everybody thinks Sandman. No. When I saw a kendo stick, when I saw the letters ECW, when I heard the chant ECW, I thought of one man. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is just incredible. Just incredible. Welcome to the Wrestling Paradox Podcast. Thank you so much for having me, man. It's awesome to be here. Dude, this is absolutely amazing. Me and Chris grew up watching ECW together, and we know who you, obviously we knew who you were all the way through. And Chris actually remembers you from your early WWF days, which we kind of want to touch on. But man, when I thought of ECW, I thought of you. I don't know why, but I was attracted to your character, your gimmick, just how badass all around you were. And I mean, it's amazing to be sitting here. So thank you for coming on tonight. Oh, it's, it's a pleasure, dude. And, and I mean, that's what it's all about. I mean, I'm just a fan of pro wrestling as well. And, uh, I, I did this uh, I, I, honestly because I didn't, I didn't know what else to do with my life. I was just such a huge fan and I really, at an early age, dedicated myself to just trying to be the best I could be at this, at this business, uh, because I truly love it. I love performing. Um, it's part of me and, you know, it just what kept me whole. And I know it sounds corny, but uh, I I love the back and forth. I love talking to you all. I love talking to fans and telling the story and just sharing these things that we all kind of connect with in the business of pro wrestling. You know, it's pretty neat. That's awesome, man. That's awesome. Well, when when it comes to ECW, guys, I'm not a fan. I'm a fucking mark. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) ECW kept my wrestling love alive in the 90s. Um, so uh, real quick, I want to jump right into it, man. And we're going to take it way back in the day. And that was uh, while you were training with uh, training under Keith Hart and yep. training alongside uh, Chris Jericho and Lance Storm, man. What was that like yeah. coming up in the business at that time? Um, I mean, it was crazy, dude. I, I literally uh, I graduated. I went to a Catholic high school. Uh, my whole my parents whole plan for me was to, you know, go to a good school because I kind of lived in a ghetto neighborhood. Uh, so they put me in Catholic school to kind of do, do the college prep thing so I can get a good education, go on to college. Once I graduated high school in 1991, my grades weren't up to par. Uh, I was I already had the wrestling bug. I was already doing backyard wrestling for many years. <laughs> I, I wish I still had the tapes. There's a couple of photos I do have on my Instagram page, which are pretty funny. But uh, I, I knew I wanted to be a pro wrestler. So uh, I worked a, as a grocery store clerk, like a bag boy, from uh, 91 to the summer of 92. And when I was on my break, uh, being a bag boy, I saw a Pro Wrestling Illustrated magazine. It was just scrolling through the magazines like we did in the 90s because, mm-hmm. you know, it was pre-internet, pre-cell phone. Mm-hmm. Um, 
and there was an advertisement of a pro wrestling camp, learn to be a pro wrestler by the hearts. And uh, there was a number on the bottom. So I called, uh, it was like three grand. I saved that up airline tickets, the whole deal. And uh, went there the summer of 92, my 19th birthday, October 16th, 1992 was my first professional wrestling match. And uh, there I was, man, starting the game. Never look back, man. Never look. No, back. man. That's that's that feels like a lost cause, man. I miss wrestling magazines. They were, they Me were too, so bro. Cool. They were so. Cool it, it was different because, like now, and I, and I and I'm not anti media. It's just I guess or anti social media. But back then, it's like you had to wait for shit, which yeah. is you know there wasn't that instant gratification. Like I didn't know who Abdullah the Butcher was except for seeing like, and this was what wrestling was so good at. Like I would go through the wrestling magazines and you'd see like um, a picture of Abdullah carving some dude's head up with a fork. And it's like Abdullah the Butcher banned in Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. Like he looked like a savage trying to kill somebody. And you're like, as a kid, your imagination runs wild. It's like this really exists, you know? And of course with, you know, with the internet, you find out oh, it's all, you know, whatever. But it was just that mystery that almost the innocence, right? Of, of, of imagination and, um, in a way, it almost killed pro wrestling or, or drastically changed it. But yeah, it just it just made uh, wrestling so much cooler because when I actually went back and watched a lot of those matches that they that were so glorified in those magazines, they actually kind of sucked. <laughs> but but if you take a snap like a snapshot of that moment, it looks so much badass. And I didn't realize until I went to Japan, like you would have a match and then you just go backstage and like they would take pictures of you like it was right away after the match. So you just pose like you're dead in the fucking locker room, like bleeding or something. And they would take <laughs> these pictures as if they were real. And that's how they would portray it. Like, so it looked like a real gimmick, you know, like a real shoot. And uh, mm -hmm. it was just brilliant. But when technology catches up, you just kind of see the reality of it. So we, you know, we kind of have to, in wrestling, we had to kind of move with the times and make it more current. But the old days are what really sold me on it. Yeah, definitely. Um, I, I don't know if we'll ever get that ECW feel back. Uh, WWE Never. is obviously so mainstream now. And yeah, I, I will tell you, if you ever make your way down to Miami, uh, there is a show. I'm coming to Tampa in a couple of days. Oh, nice. Oh, you're going to be down here for Mania. Yeah, I am. Yeah. Awesome. There's a show that uh, CCW runs who we're associated with called Bash at the okay. Brew. And it's okay. really nice because they have, they have that feel of the same crowd every month yeah. that comes yeah. in. Kind of like the ECW arena. Yep. And yep. these guys, there was a spot where uh, two guys, Vinicius and Vince Steele. Vince Steele's about 400 pounds. Vinicius is about 280. And they were like popping each other, but not moving. You know, the, the stone wall in the feeling, right, hitting right. off the yep. ropes. And that crowd was picking up the guardrails and they were just going. going and it felt yeah. so great. I'm in the crowd. I'm like, oh my God, this is amazing. This is like real, like it felt good. You know, but that's what it's all about, man. And, and with, it, it, that's the one thing I always say on podcasts when I do this, um, if I'm asked the right question, cause I have so much memory cause I'm almost going on, I'm like a year and a half removed from 30 years in the biz. So it takes a lot to sometimes jar my memory, but that's what the real uh, MVP of ECW were the fans. They made the promotion, dude. Like uh, they literally were, the the bearers of the product they made us better than we were if you really want to be a dave Meltzer analyst and critique everything as you know we we weren't that great but the fans like really were like look this is ours we own this and it was a rebellion um which a lot of people don't understand it only happens when like wwf and i'm saying wwf not wwe for a reason it was back in be pre attitude era mm -hmm. and WCW were giving the fans bullshit content. Um, a lot of corny gimmicks, Aldo Montoya myself was certainly one of them, not by choice. It was just the, the direction they were headed. Um, and ECW decided and Heyman, Paul Heyman was very smart at recognizing what the smart fans wanted, just gave them old school 79 Texas wrestling, like dusty and Terry funk blood guts brawling, good storylines, fun comedy. Like he wrapped it all up into a good ball. Sex, of course, always sells. So he threw in a bunch of hot girls and there, there goes ECW. Right. And, and, but the thing was our, our main thing was rebelling against the machine. That's why Vince's ECW never worked. 
now we're owned by the machine how could we rage quote unquote rage against the machine you know we are part of the machine and ecw just was uh it was like punk rock in the day you know that's why it still is talked about 20 something years later you know it was crazy definitely definitely well i want to stick to what we have because uh, justin i can go back and forth and just keep going out <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. to you all I'll day do. but we have a we have a format and we want to keep that going so chris go right ahead sir so being that you were in the wwf in the early uh 90s then you transition into ecw in the mid in the late 90s then back to wwe in the you know early 2000s what were the locker room dynamics in those three promotions in three different eras um, ECW was, uh, probably if you're a true artist, um, it was the best because Paul Heyman didn't want to control anyone. He wanted to kind of anything I ever did in ECW, Paul Heyman was, he would say a couple of things, you know, like I want, this is the direction. Like, I want you to like, you know, you hate this guy. This is how you, I want you to feel about him, but go about it your own way. So he was very specific about where he wanted it to go, like the end game. This is my end game. But you figure out how to get there. Mm -hmm. And he gave you the ingredients. So that was like so liberating and free. And then when I went back to WWE as X Factor with Sean Waltman, uh, just incredible, it was very much oppression where, okay, Justin, you can't do the super kick because HBK does it. Sean's a friend. I always Sean Michaels and I've always been friends, still friends to this day, but you know, business is business. You can't do the super kick. Oh, and by the way, your finish that you invented, not the tombstone, but I did it with a corkscrew. Sure. Yeah, that's I incredible. was, a, I was the only guy that ever, well, that started doing it with a corkscrew. Um, you can't do that. Cause that's too close to takers gimmick. And Oh, by the way, we don't want you wearing jean shorts and you're bald. So you don't look like stone cold. So yeah. That's rough, you know. They just took everything you had and just. Yeah, I mean, whatever. I get it. I understand their point of view, and I fucked up too, dude. I was smoking meth. Uh, I never said this on a podcast, but I figure you guys are cool enough. I could say it. I was smoking a ton of meth, dude, towards the end, and I got myself fired. I could have had a job for life. I was out of control. I was. I remember showing up late to a fucking private area. Uh, we did a house show during the afternoon. Um. The show was like 1 30 we we're in texas and we had to fly to uh somewhere in arkansas and the, arn anderson's calling me on the phone justin where are you i'm like oh i got lost i'm like five minutes from you hold the plane stephanie and hunter are on the plane i'm still in my gear in the hotel smoking a pipe um, like you know what i mean uh, ah, fuck it it's hilarious actually no. I don't <laughs> all right lucky well, yeah fuck them. i drove <laughs> it was only it was only a three-hour drive but gotcha. that's how bad it had gotten uh, a with my addiction, but B and I don't even want to go into that. Cause I dropped that a long time ago. It's, I was going to ask clean. how I've been clean now. 2021. Oh, dude. <laughs> totally. Straight. That's amazing. Man. I mean, that that's was, so yeah, that was a lifetime ago, but yeah. I was so stupid and just, you know, got wrapped up in my own thing, but it was, it was also like how stupid. Cause I was with another famous person uh, much more than I, and they got, uh, time off to go to treatment and I got fired. That's how the game was played then. And I can't tell you because I don't no. want to, but, uh, you know, he wore paint on his face. And right. yeah, and he was part uh, of a famous tag team. What, <laughs> what, uh, back to Chris's question, I kind of want to touch on what was that feel as Aldo Montoya in early, early stages of WWF? I, it, was, oh, it, it was it was it was so it was cool because um i was a kid i was seriously just learning um what it was like to be in the business full time and i don't think anybody could uh, com compartmentalize compartmentalize what it was like you had to you were on the road sometimes 30 days straight without going home and i mean wrestling 30 days like mm -hmm. Uh, schedules, flights, uh, going international. I was like 1921 between those two years of my life, uh, just traveling everywhere. Um, and you don't even know where you're going. You just kind of give it up and say whatever. And like you wake up one morning, you're in South, you know, South Africa. Then you wake up another morning, you're in Germany. Uh, you're in London. And you just, you, it's this machine. Passports that, that just stamped, baby. <laughs> uh, like crazy, dudes, you know? And it was, uh, it, was, it was just an amazing experience. But the best part for me 
which I think helped me to be Justin was I'm working with guys like Kurt Henning, Mr. Perfect. Um, the real, you know, I, cause I worked with Brian Lee as the faker taker, mm -hmm. but like I worked with Mark a lot. Um, I worked with just, you know, I worked with HBK. I worked with Razor. I just, just keep going. Marty Gennetti. Um, just always working with world-class guys. So in that time, even though a lot of these things aren't being televised, Bob Backlund, I got to work with Kevin Nash. Um, it was just, you're, you're getting an encyclopedia of knowledge, which gave me the, the license when I got to ECW to have confidence, like, dude, I've wrestled world-class cats all over the globe. I think I'm ready. Like it gave me that yeah. belief in me that I could go there and do it because when I was Aldo, I didn't believe in myself, not because I was, you know, like negative, just like I'm overwhelmed how great these guys are. And they were, mm -hmm. um, but it's just like, I could hang with them. Cool. Like maybe I could be somebody. So it just kind of kept me moving forward. You know, is it, is it possible? Maybe you didn't uh, live the gimmick, so to say, like Terry Taylor, oh. someone such a great wrestler and they have the red rooster. Obviously, I mean, he tried so hard to get that over, when a yeah. wrestler doesn't like fall in love with their gimmick or try to live that gimmick there, it's going to be tough for them. Did it's you feel fair. some type of pressure? Um, yeah. Yeah. And I, I, and one thing I can honestly say I did do, um, at least to the best of my recollection, I mean, it's been a long time, uh, over two decades, but I thought Aldo was as, as hokey as it may have seemed to the fans um, I saw it as like, to me, I was like, I'm wearing a mask, even though it looks like a jock strap. <laughs> but um, I, I tried to be like a luchador kind of gimmick because I was 226 foot. But in WWE, Owen and I were the small, Owen Hart, mm -hmm. were the smallest guys in the, in the company. Everybody else were giants. So for me, I thought like, you know, if you, if you go back and recall those matches, I was doing drop kicks off the top. I was doing topes and just trying to do trying to like fill my role what i thought they wanted so um i aldo and at the same extent was a blessing it really was like everybody thinks like oh you must have hated it i actually loved it dude i That's i awesome. I, I got to do a lot of cool things you know and I, and I learned what not to do too you know what i'm saying learned what not to do you learn from your from your from your past and you know you make sure yeah you or positivity um real quick chris before i get my next question uh, I want to ask you a question, Justin, and it's before the actual question I have written down. And Chris is like, "Nah, hold back on it, hold back on it." Uh, Justin, were you a were you one of the originals of the Click? Yes, you were. Yeah, okay. I would I've only so, read yeah. like dirt sheets on it, and you know, kind of like, oh yeah, he was. The, you know, I wanted to ask, were you one of the originals of the Click? Um. Like there's no skull and bones kind of uh, initiation to it. But mm -hmm. uh, the first story I have on the road was simply this. Um, I was 19 or maybe 20, I turned 20 and I got, I flew out to my first live event. I was still PJ Walker. I wasn't Aldo Montoya yet. Mm -hmm. And I got to the airport and uh, I had nobody to ride with. And back then in those days, you couldn't rent a car unless you were 25. I had a credit card, but I was still not old enough to rent a car. So I had to get a ride from the agents being the producers, the, the guys in charge for Vince, which were Chief J Strongbow, Tony Gurria, and Pat Patterson. They gave me a ride to the building. I get to the building, I'm about to go on and you know, whatever, do my job. And Razor comes up to me, he says, hey puss, who are you traveling with? I'm like, um, with Tony, Pat, and Chief. He's like, bro, you're gonna get, your first, first couple of days in the territory, you're gonna get so much heat traveling with the office because you're coming with me from now on so that's when we partnered up so scott hall was really the catalyst bringing me into the fold and it was it's not like it was an organized you know what i mean it was just like hey he's a kid he needs you know he needs like guidance i'm gonna bring him in and you know and then i ended up being in cars with sean and kev and kid and i was there before hunter was there dude I remember I when Hunter watched that and interview earlier about I was I was trying to watch different interviews on you. Yeah, I was there before Hunter what, and not Joni ask. were there. Yeah, I yeah. was there before Hunter and Joni were there. I remember. Anyways, like yeah, and then and then I started traveling with Paul, you know. Mm -hmm. So I mean, it was just it was just you know I, I was a silent member because I didn't matter. 
and I hate to say that and I'm not like degrading myself. It's just, I wasn't a, a main event player. I was just kind of, but I was there through every fucking circumstance and all the shit. And I got the residual heat. Let me tell you that, yeah. you know, from being with those guys, but whatever, it's what it was, you know, but I was learning. That was the whole thing was I was learning how to be good because in those car rides, we'd rent vans because we always wanted to stay together as a group because a lot of wrestling, like the business, we would talk a lot of business in the car rides because they were so long. Like you'd have 300 mile rides almost every other night. Right. So what you, and I hate to say this, this is not cool. Don't try this at home. You'd get a 30 pack of beer and you're driving down the highway talking angles. Like, what are we going to do next? And that's how you got, you listen. I just shut up and listen, mm -hmm. right. Getting an education on how the business worked. Got it. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, thank you. I, I've been wanting to ask you that since the day I messaged you, man, because I just was all good, sure man. the real answer there. Um, so my, my next question, my next question we had that I wanted to ask was, why do you think your second run in WWE didn't work out? Was it the creative aspect? What was it just WWE trying to reproduce the ECW and that whole invasion thing? Like, why didn't it work that second time around for you? In my personal opinion, I think the intention was there. Um, I came in uh, to Raw. I hit Chris Jericho over the head with a chair, interfered in Sean Waltman, X-Pac. I'll just call him Pac. Uh, interfered mm -hmm. in Pac's match. Uh, we, we formed X-Factor with Albert. Things were going good. We had a feud with the Dudleys. We took it to a pay-per-view. I think it was Backlash. And right after Backlash is when the alliance started to happen. Mm -hmm. And Sean was having problems contractually. Like he wasn't like all in at, at that point. Like if you notice in the invasion, he didn't have a lot to do if, if, if anything. Right. So it, uh, since X factor was kind of like, okay, I think, you know, we can't keep rolling with X factor. Cause at first uh, I heard we were supposed to get the tag titles. Cause we had some, some matches with edge and Christian, the Hardys, uh, Benoit and Guerrero when they were tag champions we they were trying to get us as a good and I think we would have been a great heel tag team uh, if we had the right steam um, I just think it was just a mix of the buyout of WCW where all focus changed all the storylines and everything and I think Pac's situation contractually um, uh, you know uh, and again I don't remember all the details because it has been so long but to me that's what I recall happening uh, and it just then they're like okay justin you go to the alliance and then you're just another bald dude that can't do his gimmick and you know but you're good but you're a good wrestler you're a good hand you know you can get guys over you know i i was batista's first match right. i was you know i i did a, i was shelton benjamin's like when before he he debuted on the roster i wrestled him in house shows for almost a month straight so i was like a good utility guy but for a, for a spot spot, they couldn't seem to find anything, you know, which is then kind of where the decline started for me personally, which okay. is no excuse. Like one, it doesn't justify it, but just for me mentally, I was just out of control. Gotcha. 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 So, so tell us how, how was the initial meeting with Paul Heyman? Like what was going through your mind when you first initially signed with ECW? Um, the, the first exact thing was in 1997 um scott and kevin had gone to wcw uh i respectfully called a meeting with vince i went to the office in stanford i live in waterbury connecticut which is about 45 miles from stanford where the office is call a meeting with vince i go to the office vince and i talk and i'm like vince uh because i had been as aldo i was i was really starting for the past six months or so i was like rolling to the point where I was wrestling Chris Candido in opening matches and we were going 20 minutes opening match, stealing the show. Like mm -hmm. we're, I, I, as a performer, I'm like, I'm rocking it as hard as anybody. Cause I wanted to be like HBK. Right. Like I got to travel with Sean when he won the belt at WrestleMania 12. Like it was me and Sean, like basically like every night I was in, you know, Sean and I were sharing hotel rooms. I was traveling with him to the buildings. I wanted to be that guy. So my shit started to really come together and um, 
and I went to Vince. I'm like, dude, I, I want more. I'm, I'm, I'm at an age where I feel like I could really help your company. I was doing the Jerry Maguire. Let me help you. Mm-hmm. So I, I really was that guy. Um, and Vince didn't see it. Scott and Kevin had said to me, come to, you know, we'll talk to Bischoff. I'll get you a job. Come down to WCW. So when Vince kind of didn't have an answer, I asked for my release and I still had a year left on my deal. And Vince wouldn't give me my release. He goes, it's not about Aldo. It's about the perception. If another one of my guys jumps ship, regardless how big or small, it's going to look bad. So he goes, no. But what I can do is I'll send you to W or uh, USWA, which was Jerry Lawler's territory, mm-hmm. learn to work as a heel under the WWE payroll. So I was getting paid by WWE and then come back as a heel and we'll give you a new character. I was down there for six weeks. It was horrible. I didn't learn it. I got to work a program with Lawler, but I had already worked with Lawler and WWF. Um, so the last night of my stay in USWA, Candido, Chris Candido was there with ECW. They were doing that angle with Jerry Lawler, if you will yes. recall. Mm-hmm. Yep. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Lawler, it was like, you know, Heyman was there, Sandman, Sabu, Van Dam, Dreamer. You know, like it was Team ECW against USWA. So Chris and I go back to WWE when he was Skip um, and I was Aldo and he's working with Paul um, and he's like, PJ, you got to come to ECW, blah, blah, blah. He's telling me all the perks, all the good shit. So long story, really short, Candido went to bat for me to Heyman. Heyman went to McMahon. My contract went over to ECW and then I stayed and I re-signed with ECW after my WWE contract to Paul. So I stayed there from the from the get from '97 to end. Um, what a hell of a story! I didn't know you went down there. Yeah, yeah, six weeks, that. six of the worst weeks of my life. By the <laughs> way, <laughs> yeah, I mean because horrible, well because like we don't have the technology nowadays. We didn't have it back then, you know. So it's right. Like, yeah, you didn't know. All right, this guy is going down here. You know, I was actually uh, listening to a couple things on Kane, and I guess Kane went down to Puerto Rico back. Before he was Isaac Yankum, I didn't even know about that. Like, oh, yeah. He was down in Puerto Rico, things like that, you know. So, uh, going in the Hall of Fame and they're bringing up all the shit now. And, um, one thing I want to ask you, and it's not on our thing, uh, what's your thoughts on RVD in the Hall of Fame? That's big, man. Yeah, I think it's great. I mean, Rob was the one thing I regret, uh, in my entire career, um, was rvd was the 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 number one guy in ecw even though i was the world champion paul Heyman saw this a long time ago and if you go i challenge anybody if they want to i mean for fun go back and watch ecw just incredible and rvd never once touched the right. reason we never touched was that was the ultimate dream match was to have rob van dam the world's television champion against just incredible the ecw world champion and then eventually the dream match rob would win and be the ultimate guy that was paul's foresight as as crowning rob the guy and um unfortunately we never did it and rob and i wrestled for the first and only time on a sunday night heat which you know nobody saw or remembers neither do i but it, paul had this huge grand plan anytime rob and i were in the ring together uh we even main evented a, a pay-per-view i think it was like lance and i against sabu and van dam or something close to that and we were specifically told justin and van dam never touch because wow. he was holding oh, off on that as being his like ace in the hole for you know to put rob over and have both belts Chris, no. you're a little older than me. Do you remember that like that? I I remember them never. All, it, there was, it was if both of them were in the ring, something would happen. Someone would take out one or the other, uh, to make them not touch. Mm-hmm. That's how I remember it. Yeah. I but I I I mean right now I don't re- even remember in a singles match or even in a, in, a, in a tag team. No double team moves against each other. Nope. Nothing. I never I never uh, did. Neither one of us touched one another. I mean, I literally, I'm broke as hell, dude. I'll give somebody a hundred bucks right now if they could find a clip of VCW of me and Van Damme. Because <laughs> it was like, that was wow. like Paul's big deal. That good thing like is, Paul's big deal. good thing is, is I personally know Bill Alfonso now. 
Yeah, yeah, I know. We're both connected real, through CCW. We have a ring. We have an audience. <laughs> we can make it happen, baby. <laughs> Trust me, I couldn't hang with Rob. Rob's awesome. I'm I'm nowhere near where I, I needed to be at work with a, a legend like RVD. Well, don't sell yourself short, man. Don't kill my childhood. Like <laughs> I, I loved you, dude. You were awesome, man. Don't do that to me. Um, <laughs> so Chris, uh, I'm gonna let you go ahead and ask this next question because I know that's that's one of your personal favorites and you really are interested in that. So go ahead, ask them up. During your ECW run, you had a lot of programs, storylines, and matches with the likes of uh, Dreamer, Whipwreck. Jerry Lynn, all-time favorite matches. Um, but what was going through your mind as you stepped in the ring to start off your ECW run as just incredible against the great Sas- Sas- Sasasuke? Yeah. Um, I didn't... Uh, being in the WWF bubble, I had no idea. And again, this is pre-internet. Like, mm-hmm. now I know I know a lot of wrestlers from Japan and all over the world. Back then, I had no idea who Sasuke was. I really didn't. And I remember being, we did it in Queens at the old Madhouse of Extreme. If you remember, that was that Mm -hmm. real cool ass building. Um, And Sasuke said to Heyman, or he had his Japanese, because he had a Japanese translator, because Sasuke didn't speak uh, English. He had his translator say, have, because Heyman asked the favor, like, um, you're putting credible over. And so uh, Sasuke wanted to see what I looked like in my gear. So Paul's like, get dressed, PJ. I'm like, why? It's like five o'clock, dude. It's like, get dressed. I'm like, okay. So he literally showed me off like a dog and pony show. Like I'm some like <laughs> hooker on the street. Like this is this do the turn, do, do a little turn. Okay. That's It's true. It's true. And Sasuke kind of in this mask, he never, never not wore. I don't know what the dude looks like. Wrestled him a bunch of times. Never saw him without his mask. In the mask, and then he finally said, "He just gave us okay," and that was it. Like he, it was like gangster shit. But I didn't realize, I didn't realize how big of a deal it was. Um, not until like I, not until like years later when I realized, oh wow, this dude's a fucking legend. Because yeah, when, you, when you're in the business, like you're so far removed from the mark side of it. Right. Like, because to you, it's to me, it was just like. Okay, where am I? Where do I got to be Thursday? Where do I got to be Friday? Where do I got to be Saturday? Okay, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. That's me time. Like, um, and this is before we all have instant media on our phones. I'm sure right. it's different for cats today. But then I didn't think about wrestling. I mean, I thought about okay, be in shape, be ready to go. But you're not like you know rumors and bullshit. Like, oh, I saw you know you just didn't think right like that. You know, and I was like, okay, whatever, dude. You wanted to see me in my gear. It was such an innocent time, but in in such a way, that's why the cool shit I don't think will ever be replicated is because wrestling works better with a little veil of anonymity. Right. It was very, you know, back then it was, it was, and, 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 but that's what it needed. And I guess we have to, as a, as an industry kind of do next level shit and which I try to do, um, and it doesn't always work because fans are just so smart. But like uh, when I wrestle now, like the last match I had, I was in Texas wrestling this kid from Canada, blood hunter. And it was on TV at some local like CW station. And he stiffed me and I got color for him. I was bleeding like a pig and he like stiffed me a bunch of times. And I'm like, and then I kind of cracked. I'm like, and I'm like, well, let's try to turn this into the work shoot. And I started to like, you know, do that coming out of character, bring, you know, break that wall to just bring interest. But fans are already like, ah, no, that's a work. And I'm like, well, you're right. (laughs) So it's like, they're so they're too smart instead of like just enjoying the ride. I think fans are just, I don't know. And it's just like, everybody just needs to enjoy things for what they are. If wrestling is going to truly succeed in the future or, or something, I don't know. You know, you mentioned uh, that you didn't realize how great he was until years later, going back, and you're like, that was a big fucking deal, and he was a legend. Do you ever wish that you can go back to that time when you met you met him, and you did the dog and pony show, you knew who he was, and you knew how much of an honor it would have been? No, I don't, because I would have freaked out. Smart man. I, that's what I was hoping you I would have freaked out, nothing. dude. I would have freaked out. And yeah. I think because I didn't freak out, I would, you know, if I, if I was in my own head, my own head, my head's my own worst enemy. I would have been so nervous. 
that I wouldn't have been, I would be second guessing everything. Yeah, if you would have sold think, it to him, he would. If you were in like, oh, I, you know, like it would. I, I would have got yeah. yeah. So being ignorant almost served me uh, in that situation. It was a benefit. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Totally. Um. So real quick, where uh, where do you rank the impact players on the all time tag teams, and who um, would you put above you, and who would you put below you? Wow, that's loaded. Because I've never. Uh, I mean, I don't know if I don't know what people think, but I just know we were really good. I, yeah. I can't even I can't even say uh, top twenty. I don't think so. I don't think we that can. Justice. We can say that because <laughs> well, uh, I I've never said I don't. I, but that's the thing is I don't even think like like that's the last I never thought of that question. That's actually a very interesting question. So please fill my head with shit because I, I never thought I. You're going to say you're full of shit, dude. I really never thought of that. I know we were really good because Lance helped train me, you know, and we were what I was, he wasn't. And what he wasn't, I was like, we would just complimented each other. Like I got Lance, who was like the driest Canadian wrestler. We were doing the Kevin and Sean's pose. Like I, you know, Lance was the Sean with the biceps and I had the Singapore cane doing yeah. the Kevin. We stole all that shit um so i don't know i i just i i, I would say maybe top 20 Very nice. yeah, i think i think you guys were in a time where no one saw the fluidness in the tag team like you guys right. you guys were ahead of the time because yes. there was a lot of like agile double team moves and everything like that i almost compare it to like cw anderson came up and got big in the ecw yes like at a different time at a weird time if he was 10 years sooner he would have been with Arn Anderson, you know, right next to him enforcing and everything like that. He was in yep. that gray area. And I yes. think you guys were in that same area too. That yes, both. I think so too. I think so too. And, and But that's why I don't like to say it because if I say it, it sounds weird. Right. So, and, and I know Lance don't believe it at all. Yeah. You he know, so it, every match he has, he critiques it and he finds something wrong with every match. Even if it can go flawlessly, you know? dude. I love exactly. I love Lance Storm. I feel like he's like people throw around the go to the Rock or Stone Cold. Show. Lance Storm was an absolutely like jaw dropping, amazing wrestler. Like yeah, I'm a pure technician wrestling. I am not a fan. I, I I am a fan to a certain degree of the new school wrestling. Spot 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 spot. Yeah. But dude, that old school technical feel of Lance Storm was just so refreshing. And you know what was so great about him? He never. He was so good, and I I I wrestled him. I I main evented a pay per view with him, and I wrestled him like I think he was like my match number six in my entire career. Um, and we done a bunch of tag shit, but he, dude, he was so light. Like when he hit you and it looked like he killed you, he barely he was an ace at making it look real and not hurting you. To me, as a wrestler, like because you have long, you need longevity, right? You know. Dude, that's like who you want to be in the ring with. You know, like, all right, you, you're you going to wrestle me, dude, right now. Me and you are wrestling. The one thing that you want in your head, seriously, as a security blanket, I'm not lying to you. Is you is to protect like, me. Please protect me. And I, I'll do the same for you. That's the only oath wrestlers really have is like, I'll hit you. You hit me. Let's protect one another. Lance was so good at that. Like, he never hurt me, ever. Awesome. You know, and that's what you want, because when you've got that security in your mind, then you're open to giving up more and actually uh, making the shit look better. You know what I mean? Like when there's trust, like a trust fall or something like that, or in dancing, because they do a lot of wicked, crazy flipping and <laughs> shit. It's like a trust fall. Like, uh, I trust you to be there to catch me, like on dives or stuff like that. He was that guy. You know, he was the consummate professional, you know, and that's that's one thing I learned right off the bat. It's like the one thing he said to me was, if I ever if anybody ever dives and your job is to catch them, I don't give a fuck what your thing is. You better be there to catch that person because it's not just your career. It's his career. It's and we're yeah. trying to we're trying to make money together. Mm -hmm. So we have to help one another. And he was the uh, uh, epitome of that. Are, so, you still, I mean, are you still talking to, do you still talk to Lance or? 
Um, not personally on the phone. We we tweet each other, you know. I mean, I at feel, the end of the day, he's a yeah. family man. I'm a family man, you know. Yeah, I feel really bad for him in a sense because right before COVID hit, McMahon offered him all this money to shut down his school, come work for the WWE, and then COVID hit. He buys a house in Connecticut and they drop him. What? That's what I had heard. I don't know if he's back. I with never them. heard that. That's I what, never heard yeah, that. Yeah, I'm a huge. I don't know how you feel about him. I'm a huge fan of Jim Cornette. Oh, I love. No, I love and Cornette. I love Cornette. Was talking about it probably right around last year, right after COVID hit, and he came out and he's like, "I feel horrible for Lance Storm because oh McMahon paid him all this money, closed down the school, come work for me. He got his road agent, was out there. COVID hit, and McMahon's like, "All right, I don't need you right now." Peace. Yeah. Wow. Man, yeah. Like, it sucks. Dude, like, no, I didn't hear that. I don't That's know how true shot. it is. I'm just going off what Cornette said, and like I listen to him uh, every Cornette, day. Cornette's pretty. Cornette's pretty honest. Yeah. Hey, so I don't know. I don't know where that went, but that was the last I heard about it, that. McMahon was like, "Hey, man, like I, I can't use you right now. We're not traveling." So, so it's like, damn, dude. Like you just wow. dropped the school. You just sold your house. You moved to Connecticut, and now. Wow. Yeah. See, I wish I would have known that. That's wow. not, again, that's what I heard from Corny. So, um, the, the, the one thing that you touched on really quick, Chris, and we're gonna go off a little base here really quick, uh, uh, was you mentioned that wrestlers need to protect each other and trusting each other. Do you remember the Shawn Michaels match with his return match, SummerSlam, Triple H ladder match? It was one of his first matches back. I think it was right around that 2003 area, 2004. Dude, it was like devastating to watch these guys. And then was shot. They got both got wheeled out on stretchers, like out the arena. Like it was. And then when they got back, they're like, yeah, it was great. Like I protected them. Sean was like, it was amazing. He made sure I was safe throughout the whole match. So I, I mean, just that side of it, like you, you have to protect the next person. You have to be able to trust who you're working with. So it, it's definitely something that goes through every wrestler's mind. I'm sure. I mean, yeah. I, I never saw that match. You never but... saw that match? It was I think it was his first. No. Chris, you remember what I'm talking about? Uh, I think that was during a time period where I wasn't watching WWE. Yeah, it was a lot. It was one of Sean's first matches back because he had hurt his back and he was out for a while. And then he came back. Yeah, I remember he, that. Yeah, he he wasn't sure he wasn't sure what was going to happen if he was going to wrestle again. And uh, sure, right, uh, it's like 2005, 2006. Right in that area. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because yeah, yeah. that's when I started. Because I was. Uh, I actually went down to Sean's. I stayed at Sean's house for two weeks and I actually helped him uh, train Daniel Bryan, Lance Cade, and a couple of other guys. Oh, hell yeah. Uh, yeah, I went down there for his, uh, his, it was, uh, what was it called? Oh my God. Anyways, TW, no, Texas Wrestling Alliance. He had a belt. I won his belt and then uh, Paul Diamond beat me and then I handed it over to Sean and then he had a match, like a hardcore match, but then he went out until. 2005 with what you're talking about now i fucking mm -hmm. remember holy shit yeah yeah i don't know man i think that was i don't know i think that was half work yeah because i the stretches <laughs> yeah because i think yeah they, that was yeah but that, I, I again think... but I, but what i what, what i say by that is though but that's what we need as fans yep. and I'm, I'm talking to me as a fan we need to believe mm -hmm. like sometimes it's better for us to not know Mm -hmm. You know, like sometimes being all knowing, like I'm a huge Marvel Universe fan. Yep. And like when I watch like sometimes like I have it on my TikTok feed and I watch some backstage shit. And it's like they're making jokes like that's not Iron Man. That's not, you know, Captain America. I want to see yeah. we're we all love our shit because it's an escape. Wrestling is an escape. I think if fans just choose to enjoy it for what it is, it makes it cool. And wrestlers just have to keep coming up with different ways to make it like believable. And I think we've kind of reached, uh, we can't, you know, it's like, yeah, yeah. dude, we yeah. can't take it any further. So I think just enjoy it, you know? Yeah. I, I've, I've said for years that wrestling to me is an escape from reality and that's the way it should be. It should be fun. It should yeah. be like, we're not trying to pull any punches here. We're not trying to like fucking warp anybody's mind. Let's just have some fun. Right. Mm -hmm. You know what it is, dude, you know, because <laughs> kids are also getting really hurt. Yeah. One thing I hate to say is um, in these like this day and age, especially with the AEW kids, and I, I respect all of them, um, you know, but they don't understand um, like 
you're 23 and you're dropping yourself on your head almost right. every other week. It, I'm 47. I was doing nothing compared to that. And my shit hurts to where I can't walk sometimes. So what do you think you're going to feel like? Just chill out, entertain the people. But like, I, I, I'm like scared for, for this generation because we're not, you know, e, A, you're not giving us like the good storylines you're supposed to be giving us. And B, you're killing yourself, dude. So we just got to be better as a community. I think if we had like a more loving, well, I'm going to sound like a fucking hippie. But if we were just more loving, understanding of everything, what everybody goes through and just be chill and just support what we like, I think everybody would be a little more, yeah, I don't know, into it. Like, just don't be dicks about it. Like, people fuck up. Life is life. Yeah. You know, I mean, there's some great cats out there, you know, but not everybody's AJ Styles. You know, there's just not that much talent out there, dude. And I don't know. So I did, I did some quick research. It was a 2002 unsanctioned street fight. That's what it was. Now I'm going to have to watch that. The minute you I gotta go off, back. Now dude, it was a great match. Now I'm going it was amazing. Now I'm going Juice to. everywhere. It was, it was amazing. Great match. Um, now let me ask you this real quick. Do you think Juice adds to it? Do I think Juice adds to wrestling? Yes. In the right areas. In the right okay. spot. I believe when it when it's when blood. it's when it's warranted when it's warranted when it's a blow yeah. off I believe it's when a, blow it's a blow off, off. Yeah. yeah I agree I you just think, wanted to know like I, yeah. I didn't want to cut you um, off of your of your question but the, I'm just curious one so I always talk about um, me and Chris always go back and forth on uh, storylines and how long they should go things like that to me uh, I always went by what uh, Jr said a book is eight chapters and then at the final chapter that's where you have your big blow off. So one that I always think of was Batista and Triple H. Um, okay. They had a solid 12 weeks of just going back and forth, back. And forth. Then they had the big blow off after three pay-per-views inside of Hell in a Cell. Yep. Blood, juice, everything. It was, it was crazy. It was amazing to see. If they did that in the first match, it wouldn't have been as big as what it was in that, yep. in that, in that 12-week program. You no, know? I agree. So, I agree, 100%. If, if it's warranted, it's definitely belonging. Um, okay. Chris, go ahead. Next question, what? If you could or would get, um, make a return right now, who would it be against and why? Um, it would be against John Moxley. Um, okay. Why? Because just the way uh, I just, for business purposes, I think the, the way he embraces hardcore, um, I, you know, it would just be an easy fit. Uh, I don't think I could hang with Kenny Omega at this age uh, at 47. Not to say that I, you know, I'm not like cripple or anything, but I just couldn't do Kenny justice. Mm -hmm. But with Moxley, I think I could, uh, it would be more of a brawl. But, in, you know, again, I, I'm not trying to pigeonhole myself to saying I wouldn't be able to do wrestling stuff, but just not to the level of Omega. Uh, and it just would be a more, it would... Uh, Wow, I never thought I would say this. And please don't, I'm not trying to say I'm anything like Terry Funk because he's too great, but it would be like Funk uh, in, when he came into ECW, he was 48, I'm um, 47. So it would be like just incredible at Funk's age versus the young book uh, <laughs> in, in John Moxley. So I would be the old guy uh, taking the beating slash, you know what I'm saying? Like that, oh, kind yeah. of narr yeah. that narrative is what I'm saying. Not, not in reality, uh, but you know, that's what I would go for. Definitely Moxley. Um, okay. You've obviously been on a bunch of podcasts. They always play a little games on what do you think of this or what do you think of that? Uh, we're going to do one word associations. Okay. Okay. We have a few people here and uh, they're a mixture of companies, bookers and talent. Okay. Uh, so the first one that I'm going to ask you, are you ready? Yep. If you need to give me two words, three words, that's fine. But we try to stick to one. Tommy Dreamer. Wrestling. Beautiful. Chris, you want to go next? And we'll just keep going down the list like that? Yep. AEW. Indie Rific. <laughs> Jerry Lynn. One of the best ever. WWE now. <laughs> Garbage. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Um, Lance Storm. Wow. Um, wow. 
Um, oh, wow. Give me a second. This is going to be awkward. I love this part of it. When, when we, they don't answer, I love that. They have to no, answer. because I want to say it right because it's important. But I want to also make it right. Awkward, Canadian, awesome. I'll take it. I'll take it. I'll take it. <laughs> That's a shoot. <laughs> so the next one is Shawn Michaels. Heartbreak Kid. That's a shoot. Wrestling Society X. Ahead of their time. Okay. TNA when you were there for that brief stint. Really good. Underrated. They had an, I think it was they, they had an opportunity. They had a real opportunity. They, I, I was, uh, I, I, I fell in love with TNA quite early, and then after Aces and Ace fell out, man, I was just like, I almost felt like it lost its, its touch. It, su- it sucks because they could have really been something. They really could have. Um, next one is going to be your friend and mine, Paul Heyman. The devil. <laughs> I wasn't expecting Straight that, up. But... No, straight up. The devil. He's Satan. He's yeah. the devil. Yeah, he's Lucifer. That's, I, I wouldn't doubt it. Like, I honestly wouldn't doubt it. Okay, you want to know why I say that? No, if go I ahead, expand, please. expand, because it was a one-word thing. Um, in the movie, what was that Pacino movie? No, uh, Devil's Donnie Darko or Devil's Advocate? What? Devil's Advocate. Mm-hmm. That's him. That's Paul Heyman, Pacino's character. That's wow. him. That's that's for shoot him. And I'm I'm fucking Keanu Reeves. That's how he plays you. No, dude. I'm my wow. wife and I. I've been married twenty something years to my wife. Same girl, same love, celibate, whatever or whatever the fuck monogamy you call it. We've shared this a million times. He is that guy in the Devil's Advocate. He's the devil. He's wow. Satan. That's how he plays. That's how he rolls. Watch that movie and all those little parts he plays to everybody in that movie. That's how he rolls in the wrestling business. Do you still have a relationship with Paul? No, no, no. no. All right. And last but not least, Pat Patterson. Amazing. Amazing. uh, An angel. Honestly, an angel. I've, we've him. heard that a lot. We've heard it, Love read it him. a lot. He's, yeah. he, he would bend over backwards to get over new talent and to find new talent to push, you know. He was, he was amazing. And like, it's funny. I, I just watched an episode of the new rock. And uh, one of the last moments I had with Pat, um, you know, cause I had never had like a lot of huge moments with rock Dwayne Johnson, whatever. Uh, But one night after Raw, I think, no, it wasn't Raw, it was SmackDown. We were in Montreal, and Pat Patterson was a huge karaoke fan. Mm -hmm. He used to do, like, Frank Sinatra uh, stuff, uh, uh, you know, in karaoke. So Pat was, like, really proud. He's like, you're in my hometown, you know, and I was always friends with Pat. He's like, come to this club with me. So me, Rock, and Jericho, we went to Pat's karaoke club and pat was there jericho myself and rock rock sang devil went down to georgia but he did it with all rock style as you can imagine him saying you know smack down and like him doing that with devil went down to georgia jericho did jericho did something i I don't recall what jericho did uh pat patterson went up he sang frank sinatra's my way and then i went up and sang kid rocks only god knows why and it was us four that night. And it was a night I will never forget. And uh, but anyways, wrong story short, Rock honored uh, Jericho on, on the the Rocks, the Young Rock show, uh, and pa- or honored Patterson. Sorry, okay. duh. Yeah. But it, it was awesome. Love uh, that guy. That one was of the awesome. cool. One of the cool moments that I had is uh, I actually work out. At, I did. I did. Not anymore. I'm kind of letting myself go a little bit. Uh, <laughs> L.A. Fitness down here in uh, in Hollywood, and uh, over about five miles away from me was the L.A. Fitness. And uh, uh, Pat Patterson actually worked out at that LA fitness and not once did I ever go up to him. Not, and I just didn't want to be that guy at the gym. He's just right. an older guy trying to live, you know, live out his life and things like that. And, but it was always cool to be on the treadmill and look over and be like, there's Pat on the leg machine. And he was just sitting there and just about five pounds, nothing, nothing crazy, just enough, right, to get going, right. you know? And uh, it was, it was such a mark in me kind of moment to be like, Oh my God, you're Pat Patterson. But at the same time, I'm like, he's still a guy. And that's right. at the end of the day, I think people forget that. And uh, they the do. And he was still people. 
And the thing is, the thing that makes me sad, and I wish, you know, because wrestlers also don't like to share their human part. And I'm, I'm totally opposite of that. I really like to share. Uh, but it, sometimes it fucks you up. Uh, but Pat always kept it in. And deep down inside, like, he would cry. Like, you know, like he would share moments where he would be in tears to me. Um, and it breaks your heart because you could feel like, you know, this man is alone. He's going through shit. He lost, he lost his best friend, his mate, his lover, uh, it will, about five years before he passed. And that changed him, you know? And it's just like, you don't know. Sometimes you just don't know how to say it's going to be all right, but dude, we're just human beings, mm-hmm. yeah. you know? And sometimes just to tell, you know, and I was afraid to say anything, so I didn't, but you always regret it. I'm like, if I just maybe gave him a hug and said, dude, uh, you know, if I'm, I'm always here if you want to talk. You know, because sometimes that star shit gets in your way and you don't want to go there, you know, and it's yeah. weird. Yeah, it is weird. You're right. You're right. You're I, right. It's, it's kind of funny because I've developed this, uh, <laughs> me personally, because I'm a little more into the CCW thing. Chris kind of stays to the side a little bit with the with just the interviews and things like that. But I've actually developed a, a pretty decent name on like first name basis with Bill Alfonso. And that's yeah. like one of the coolest things ever. And like, he comes down and he's like, Hey daddy, how's your boy Roman doing? And you know, he talks to me and it's like, yeah. wow, man, that's such like a cool thing. Like somebody my dad knew growing up now is right. on a first name basis with me in the wrestling yeah. business. And dude, I, at the end of the day, man, I, I kind of mark out every time, but now it's just like, Bill's just a person. Yeah. And um, he's a, he's a great dude. He's a great person, dude. Uh, yeah. I, I remember, and he's kind of like a hero of mine because um, I went to rehab uh, in Tampa to the same place he went to rehab in, um, in 2017. And um, everybody had told me, you know, Bill Alfonso was here. Fonzie was here and he got his whole life back, you know, like he straightened up everything in his life. And it was like awesome to hear that to, to this day. I still haven't seen Bill face to face to congratulate you know what i mean just to right. see that wonder like because he's like a, a hero to a lot of us because he's done it he's done the work and he's come out the other side and he's such a good dude and uh we sometimes forget like just to say wow thank you dude you know and you're awesome like some we were so we try to be so cool and collected we forget to just be ourselves in the moment you know and yeah fonzie's one of the best a great a great dude right on that's awesome, man. Well, Justin, I feel like we have, uh, I think we've reached the end here. And man, this has been absolutely amazing. And I cannot thank you. Thank you enough. Thank you. you are, you were, uh, I don't know if I, I don't know childhood hero or just somebody I was so fascinated with growing up. It was just something different about you. And like I said, man, it, it, people will see the kendo stick and like, oh, that guy over there. No, man, it was just incredible who I thought of. And I feel like Chris, I, sp- I speak for Chris and, you know, uh, my boy Mike over there too, man. It's It's been a pleasure having you on and we can't thank you enough for that. So it's been an uh, honor. It's been an it, honor. It's been a real honor. Thank you. Um, thank Justin, you. I'm going to give you, I usually do this for the younger talent that we have on, but man, can I get a just incredible like promo right now? Oh, of just course. Like 60 seconds. Just give it to me. Whatever you want. What's, what's the name of the podcast? Re- Wrestling Paradox Podcast. Wrestling Paradox Podcast. Now that's not just the coolest. Wrestling Paradox Podcast. Now that's not just the best. Wrestling Paradox Podcast. Well, that, my friends, is just incredible. I love it, Justin. Thank you so much, man. You still got it, man. (laughs) You still got it. (laughs) Thank you. You still. (laughs) Thank you. Dude, you're awesome, man. Thank you. Um, Look, I I, I I would love to bring you back for part two. I know the people are going to ask for it one day, so that will definitely happen. So I got your number now. You can't avoid me, sir. (laughs) No, I don't want to. I don't want to. I'm always here. You're awesome, man. Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, thank you you so much again for tuning in to this amazing interview with Justin Credible and ECW legend icon everything he is just incredible and that is why we brought him on tonight thank you again so much justin stay right there don't go anywhere we're gonna talk to you off the line hey chris you know what time it is right say something stupid stupid <laughs>